We will press on. Not the greatest start to uh, our slot today, but you are very welcome. I think this actually is a, a very, very good indicator of no. the, 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 the next hour of radio. It, encapsula don't agree with this. it encapsulates sort of the, the theme of no. things. I don't agree with that. We have to have standards. We'll do better next week, I promise. So this is, uh, well, we've decided upon a name for this slot, which is Massive Progress. Uh, this has been at various points called, and the first one, not by me, the Gary Doherty era, which was uh, grotesquely unfair by somebody who was saying it was a waste of space, but took up space. <laughs> I can't remember what the logic I was. I think it was took Did up space job. and served a purpose. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a waste of space. <laughs> Other suggestions for the name of this lot we had were Chewing the Fat, The Dribble Hour, a Loose Passing, Joe and Colleagues, which I have to say I gave some thought to. Uh, then we had Loose Lips and Heavy Thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we are now, all the lads. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> lips and heavy thoughts. <laughs> anyway, uh, what we were looking for was a, a name of this um, burgeoning, and it may well be short-lived slot, I have to say, to um, uh, do what it says in the tin, but also give it a sense of identity. There's like an OTB PM team raw uh, quality to what we're doing here with Arthur and Ronan and Mick. And so what we realised on last week's edition is that... at O various points across the air, all of us use the phrase just a slight tangent as we introduced another slight tangent. So the name of the slot is a slight tangent. That's there not bad. Go. It's very no. on the nose, isn't it? It's not. Well, we need well, it, it the yeah. Joe's entire point is that it has to be on the nose or else he's like no, fair quitting. Point. It's good. There's a Ron Seal texture to, uh, to the name here. Precisely. A slight tangent. <laughs> You're very welcome along to a slight tangent. Good. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. We We're will on. be uh, developing an email address, a slight tangent at offtheball.com, correct? Uh, do you know what? If you start sending those emails by Friday, yeah. I hope to have something set up at that stage, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'll be checking it too often. <laughs> Yeah, OK, so we're up and running and uh, we're just going to chat away. Get in touch, 53106 is the text number. We are at Off The Ball, obviously on Twitter as well, and soon to be a slight tangent at offtheball.com. I feel the slot lends itself to lengthy emails. There was a great one about uh, somebody who's, whose love of the Premier League was dwindling over time, which we used a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there were some questions we didn't get to last week. Somebody was wondering, uh, your dream dinner party of Irish sports people, we'll come back to that. Uh, thoughts on the Arsenal all or nothing are these documentaries actually any good uh, Haaland has adapted to the Premier League despite all the fears which player adapted most quickly to the Premier League uh, somebody asked last week you discussed the greatest sounds in sport which we did oh, yeah. we? Not, not by choice no kind of it went up, surprisingly yeah. better than we thought on first reading the text what's the greatest photo in sports history asked somebody uh, somebody wanted to just to touch on the Bernardo Silva quotes in Man City. And then a final one. Are Barcelona now the worst club in the world? They are stealing £17 million from one of their players. They are just some of the questions in. We will do our best to get to them. Uh, first point for discussion is something that we have discussed amongst ourselves probably quite a bit, I guess. And maybe the whole point of this slot is for us to take more of that to the airwaves. I don't really know how to set this up, Ronan. We all know what we're talking about because we experience it both as... Uh, listeners of media and readers of media, but also just working in this um, sphere where we have to decide who's a good guest and why to get on. So I think your point is that the internet has ruined football journalism in particular. Yeah, I'm definitely prefacing this not as a die end of journalism, more so as a consumer of, of media, because what I suppose the veneer or the pretense, to use those words, of impartiality are all but gone in most cases, I would say now, and what fans of certain clubs are being served up is not propaganda, but is adjacent to that, where it's very much configured down the lens of what you want to hear, and I suppose there's a implied bias there as well. And given the prominence of that, and like I started working here about six years ago, and I think in that time this trend has developed and become the norm in a way where there was fan culture as a subsidiary almost of the mainstream media, whereas now that fan culture has become the mainstream media in many ways. And I think the fact that it's got that due prominence would suggest that is what people want. Mm. That's what people are clicking on, that's what people are listening to, and there are probably different upsets to that um, reasoning behind it. But I find it quite frustrating as somebody who wants a more global sense or universal sense, more nuanced appraisal of different teams, not through the lens of individual teams, but rather more considered sort of entwined mm. perceptions. 
Um, so what could, there's very us, few people a, who give that now. Give us a practical example of what you're talking about. Well, uh, I suppose the onset of podcasts in particular, I suppose, have mean there's a market for individualised content, in, which didn't exist. Um, like when Off the Ball first started, presumably in 2002, trying to cater to as many clubs as possible, whereas nowadays people can seek out stuff that serves their specific purposes. And I would say the, the multifaceted elements of it have been lost in that regard, where people are mainlining stuff that only looks through things from their own football club's perspective and elements beyond that are somewhat lost. And those who want a more considered, um, I suppose, analysis that takes into account outside factors, that's been shut down. It's like anything that's critical of our club. And I suppose the most, I don't know, pr prominent example of this at the moment is the Man City critique and latterly the Newcastle critique where they don't want to hear about what's going on behind the scenes of the club and where the money's coming from. They want praise of the on-field product and all that goes with that. And I think those are prime examples of it, but it, to single those clubs out is probably unfair because I think it's true of all clubs. And I'm talking about this in a Premier League perspective, but I think it's not just a uniquely football issue either. So what are we talking about here, Mick? What, 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 like Ronan's to discuss the problem, you'd have thoughts on all this. Why, try and Because I, I, some of you may still not be sure, what are we talking about here? <laughs> I suppose we might, we might have different views on exactly what we're talking about. Sometimes it can be, is it, uh, you know, are, are reporters fans of the club now? But I think it's more that they are catering to the club's fans in a way that... I suppose when I... I don't have a problem with, like, say, a Manchester United correspondent or whatever who kind of only... Talk, only covers Manchester United yeah. and is involved in the club and me and Ra we'll get to it in a while about like some of the greatest American um, uh, uh, reporters of all time and how close they were to the teams but what you had with them was a sense of uh, a, a supporter would trust them but would trust them to tell you exactly what was going on mm. whereas now I think we veered towards supporters uh, th them giving you in some ways what the club wants you to know because they are close to the club and want to maintain that relationship at all costs. The relationships almost don't come for free anymore. You don't, they, they are conditional. You know, you, they, clubs, um, say if we're talking about football clubs in particular here, but sports in general, will almost freeze out and deny access and deny information, I suppose, to uh, people who don't sort of toe the party line to a certain extent, you know, like I, I, think, I think we're definitely at least heading in that direction. But also, what we expect as fans from those uh, reporters is a completely different thing than what it would have been in the past. So I would want, you know, if I'm a Manchester United fan, I want the Manchester United uh, person to be uh, on the inside, have the information, getting all the scoops, but that's because I want to find out what's going on in the club. Whereas now, the fans, I think, want someone who is defensive of the club. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like, they're, if you're a Manchester City fan, you're being attacked from all angles, and your instinct is to say, my club, my guys, and therefore I want my correspondent to defend the club in yeah. the same way. Whereas I don't think that was an issue before. I think I wanted the truth, because yeah. if the club was up to bloody no good, or if the club was doing something I didn't like, then I trusted this guy to tell me about it. Well, I think that's the, been the biggest change. So, like, I'm going to use uh, examples here of, of clubs, and I'm not. I'm actually just plucking them. So was I. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not thinking through, about yeah. it. And they, like, who are we to criticize any individual, or whatever? But say, for instance, down the years, I would think the Man United correspondent, whichever paper, whichever publication, should be like hated by the club in a way. Like the Man United correspondent yes. should be publishing stories they don't want out and have lots of contacts in and around the club and be very critical of the club and be writing very honestly about the club. And for me, that would be the role. And then as a fan, you get served up the truth. And some of it's not very good. Some of it's like, this is why the club's a mess, etc. Whereas I do think, and I, my sense would be it's been the internet and it's been Twitter a little bit. Where it's gone to now is, as you sort of said, Ronan, those journalists now giving the fans what they want Mm. which is almost advocating on behalf of the club, say it's Newcastle or Man City and they're being criticised for the ownership, almost defending the club a little bit. Say there's been a squabble between Gerard and Mings, almost saying, oh no, actually they're getting on just fine and it's not as bad as you think, this kind of stuff. And I, we had a really interesting example of this 
in the last 18 months so I mean don't want to be too specific <laughs> but it, was, it was very interesting we had a, a correspondent who just covers one club on and this is like correspondent this isn't you know the host of the fan podcast and I was critical of the manager or asking a kind of an open enough question which was kind of critical of the manager and the response was very defensive of the manager and and like strongly defensive I, th- I thought I thought that's overly strongly defensive at the time and what blew me away was that on social media afterwards which I was like involved in and other um, the person involved was involved in his you know, I had a bunch of fans saying there's our correspondent or that's our correspondent can I, I wager some for a second I, I, but I, that, that w- I was like what yeah no this I, is not, it can't be going this way yeah. uh, and the last the last yeah. point I'd say and then come in is what I think has happened with the internet is say you are the Man United correspondent to stick with that example for a moment for a company I think what's now happened is because of the internet and because of the voices everyone has if you're the Man United correspondent and your boss sees that all the Man United fans hate you then your days are numbered yeah. and, and I think that is informing I better stay on the right side of these guys yeah because I, the, the only thing I'm kind of curious about here but, so we're uh, obviously we're, seem to be somewhat refraining collectively from mentioning a specific thing that changed the landscape of English football media entirely but it's almost like an inverse globalisation so what essentially when I don't know I, I seem hesitant now of even mentioning it because no one else has yeah. we're talking about the Athletic we're not. I don't no, think we're no, no, I think to the degree, are no, but to, an no, 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 bear with yeah. me. Bear with me. To a second, we're talking about the degree that the elect, they changed everything, and that was the big change because they hired up a load of local correspondents from the Liverpool Echo, from the Manchester Evening News, from the Newcastle Chronicle, all these different places. And now what we're just getting on a centralised hub is what people I think we're always getting. So the new, the, the, all these papers were still catering to those local audiences, but just not everyone saw it. Maybe, yeah. And I just think that what they've done is they're just trying to centralise and commodify that on a huge scale. And this is kind of the, a bit of the after that you see of that. But I, I don't think it's anything new. I don't think uh, this is always there. Like, it, I, see, I think I, it is new. I, I think there's definitely more I've got to stay on side with the fans. Because when, on social media, not if I have... Oh. Because the fans didn't want it, in my opinion. So, like, I, look, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying any more than I can, you can. But I don't think either of us can claim to know what Huddersfield fans wanted from the Yorkshire Evening no, Post. We're talking about general sport, though. Like, I mean, okay, right. The American thing I talked about in the past, and just this is because you'd hear because there's books written and endless podcasts. Right? Say, take the Boston Celtics for example, mm. all the way through the '80s, the Larry Bird era, and how successful they were. You had Bob Ryan. Diane of Boston sports writing, right, was the beat reporter for the Boston Globe in the Celtics dressing room, and then he was replaced by Jackie McMullen, a woman who, that entire story of how she got into the locker room and how she kind of overcame that is like a legendary story in itself. But both of them incredibly close to the team, incredibly close to the general managers, incredibly close to the coach, and incredibly close to the owners and the organisation yeah. in general. Friends with them, out drinking with them, yeah. right? But were also co- uh, breaking stories about them that weren't always great. And like Larry Bird would fall out with Bob Ryan for six months and not talk and ignore him in the locker room, but he's still in there with him. You know, it was a different world. Yeah. And what, and, but if you're, if you're the Boston Celtics supporter, you trusted Bob Ryan as a guy who wasn't a fan of the team, but he was your guy to keep you informed of what was going on in the team. And I think it's to Joe's point about the internet how it's changed things and that's like you know you can talk about the athletic I think that's just the natural follow on of what's changed in general so what the fan wanted was the truth and now what they want is if I'm a Celtics fan now let's stick with basketball and I'm on Twitter all day every day and I have Nets fans and Knicks fans and everybody at Lakers fans constantly talking about how crap my team is or how you know we're you know falling apart or whatever it is and we lost the finals then you become defensive of the team in the way you weren't before because the only other people you used to talk to was Celtics fans. So they were both the team you support and they were also your kind of enemy in a way as well because they weren't doing the things you wanted. Mm. Whereas now there's this defensiveness. And that's... So what I'm saying is that now people want something different from a correspondent than they well, did I don't in the past. Th- I don't think they have anywhere, but correspondents don't have anywhere near the same access. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, so I, 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 that, I, don't, I think it's, I think it's so kind of false. Point, like, Man United are a constant laughing stock. In, in the media and that's amongst the, the their cov their like their coverage as well. Like it's not nobody in the athletics say if we stick with that example for this, is no nobody's sticking 
Oh, geez, like I, the, the, the bits I do read, like there's nothing that's kind of completely glossy. It's not like in, in Spain with like Marca and Ass or whatever yeah, the two no. of them. Like it's not, these aren't. Do you think it's going to go that way? Party political. Like, I don't what think about, so. What about when you see like so called like correspondents of clubs like uh, you know tweeting in ca- all caps when they score a goal and yeah, all that. Yeah. Kind of, that, that I don't, it doesn't sit well with me I don't either. know what to think about that. No, anymore. it doesn't sit well with me either. I'm not saying it does. I'm just, I, I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I think people have always liked to be told that the thing they like is good. But that and dismissive tagline of fans with typewriters, nobody's been naive to the notion that the reason people get involved in football journalism is because there's the, the kernel of that implied support which they would have grown up with and it's hard to detach yourself from that. There was a sense possibly in years gone by where people would overcompensate to the nth degree almost yeah. to yeah. hide their uh, their passions in that regard. But yeah, the goal thing I think is a perfect synopsis of something that really gets my wake a little bit. Like. But it's the, it's the inverse. As you said, you'd, you'd support a team, you'd become a correspondent and you'd hide who you supported. Mm. Whereas now you kind of laud the fact that I'm covering the team, I'm cheering the team on. Yeah, We've scored, here's our boss. And it's like, oh, here's what he had to say, that kind of stuff. It's excuse making when the result doesn't go your way and like having to go with the referee. It's like, this is not a journalism ethics as far as I can tell. Do you think it's down to internet and Twitter? Yeah, I think you've all raised very good points there. And the internet, as with every strand of life at the moment, centralises these matters. But um, as much as keeping fans on side, it's also about keeping the club on side, which is something you mentioned because Equally, employers don't want to be looking at their correspondent and thinking the fans don't like you, but equally they don't want every other correspondent from all the other outlets breaking a story, getting the briefing, and you didn't because you had to go at the club last week. Like It would be interesting to see um, 15 years ago or whatever how the Glazer takeover was handled by correspondents at the time versus how the, the next takeover of Manchester United, which is seemingly coming down the tracks, how that will be covered. I'd say it'll be markedly different. The yeah. access point is interesting though because if you're, say, I agree with Arthur's point that nobody's riding glossy all as well at Manchester United, things are going great. Yeah. But what I do find is that what a lot of them will do, and I think there's an Aston Villa uh, point you mentioned today, is that ostensibly it's trying to tell you what the story is and here's the inside track because I'm the only one getting that information. But it's also often written in a kind of a this is the way it's been presented to me is the only version that you're getting. Mm. So while nobody, while the opinion part of the writing isn't suggesting that all is glossy at Man United, Ten Hag will turn it around, they'll win the league within two years and this is the plan and this is what the club have told me. The information you're getting is only coming from one place. Mm. You know, and the, you know, the, that, that is what concerns me. It's like it's taken at face value to a certain extent mm. because you've been handpicked to say like this guy gives us favorable or at least guys this guy doesn't kill us it depends on what, what situation you're in and therefore the club give you access how do you stop that do you bandy together and say you know you know I hope to get this information but I'll write what I want and if I have counter information that will go out too and you know is there always going to be the the person who just says, well, I'll, I'll be the only one getting the interview then, that's great. Mm. And I'll get the... I don't know, it, it's, so hard, it's so hard to kind of know what would be better. You're not buying this. It's not that long ago since Alex Ferguson was banging, bang, banning people yeah. from Man United press conferences. No, that's true. No, Ferguson, yeah. Like, now they're not, all Ferguson, though. I, well, I, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know enough about that now to, to... I don't know what... I've not held up enough stories to look for where the inaccuracies are or where there's certain things missing in other ones. Eddie Howe was tanked uh, for... Um, at the end of the season, in in a press conference for yeah, and uh, the work he did to in improving uh, Newcastle, and apologised to for the way he was asked questions about Saudi Arabia. Oh, that was from a national paper, though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, there should be no apology for asking questions about Saudi Arabia. I don't think it's a terrible thing if there's a working relationship and it's like thanks for everything for the season, Eddie. I have no problem with that. I actually don't have a problem with that. That's just. Like I think it was more relations. thanks what you've done for the city or thanks what you've done for the team rather right, than okay, for well. the for the. I, I think it's absolutely perfectly fine to say thanks for everything this yeah. year in terms of yeah yeah no that's. I don't know the thing. specifics of that. I just think as a, as a final thought, look, there's always it's tricky because we're trying to like generalize very different situations and different eras. But I think the the overwhelming difference, as Ronan said, is that it's it's gone from being like. I've got to hide my allegiance and be objective 
even if I'm covering the same club week in, week out. And, I've, you know, David Meek of the Manchester Evening News formed great relationships with the Manchester players in Ferguson. But it's gone from, I've got to hide the allegiance to now, like, if I tweet goal in capital letters, I get 10,000 likes. And I'm like, the boys did great. And, it, you know, it's just a, it's a different tone. That's a sorry state of affair. It's not, it's not enjoy. It's, it, it, it's, it's like, it's pretty, because it doesn't seem like then it's too far from exactly what Mick's talking about, like, one, to the next step. But what, the, what but the fan, here, the interesting thing is, the fans seem to really like it. It's yeah. a bit like, you know, I, I'm a Republican and I like watching Fox TV and I only go on Republican websites and it's like yeah, this, yeah. this circle that goes on and I, I, this is what I like. The market dictates, that's, that's the reality of it. And yeah. if people wanted more nuanced, refined, you know, multifaceted analyses, they would seek them out and those would be the ones that'd be front and centre, but go on any of the mainstream websites, that's not the kind of stuff you're seeing. You're seeing very one-eyed like singularly focused items on taking a particular position on a particular team mm. and this isn't a uniquely football thing even though that was the jumping off point like Mick cited a few US examples like Stephen A. Smith probably the most recognisable media face in America yeah. and half his living is slagging the Dallas Cowboys so he's taking the opposing view like putting his bias against them to the forefront and then on the flip side of that, Bill Simmons be one of the most respected uh, journalists in America. Equally, his Boston fandom made his name in the States, but he's still considered someone who can take a more, you know, entwined lens on things and, and, and analyze all the other teams somewhat fairly. Yeah. So I think there is still room for that, but um, it's definitely, the tide has turned, I would say. We'll take a short break, just on this note. Lads, I've no idea what you're talking about, but Slight Tangent is a terrible name. Uh, we'll take a short break and be back in one second. <laughs> Now you're very welcome back to A Slight Tangent. Joe here, Mick here, Arthur here, Ronan here. Some of the texts in before we move off this topic. So Bonnie got me on Twitter, said, good journalism I think will retain its value and sustain the new arena, but there is undoubtedly a leap towards click and immediacy from the net. I think the mistake is to chase that. Is the new reporting more about simple base entertainment? Somebody else says, lads, are you saying that the club correspondents are now turning into de facto members of the club's PR department, Mick, in Dublin? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we probably didn't define it terribly well what we're saying, Mick. And I the trend isn't finished yet, so in some ways it's hard to know what we're saying. But what's very notable is I think we're probably seeing, as Ronan said, that veneer of being objective is gone. You're now, like, cheering on the team. Uh, very much so on Twitter in particular and cheering on the goals and talking about, you know, our boss said this after the game and, you know, that's our captain, our capto, our capto Hendo had to this, this. <laughs> you know, th that kind of stuff is, is is very striking the way that's crept in. Again, I'm just picking, I picked United, I picked Liverpool, I'm picking the big clubs. So I don't know if they're de facto members of the PR department because I, I still, as Arthur said, I still think they'll write, you know, like a critical piece of Man United now is very popular with the fans because the fans hate Man United. <laughs> so it's not that they're never critical, but I think there's this constant, like the internet is such a, it's, the internet is, 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 is changing us at every bump. Like we're, we're in a car or we're like a bowling ball going down an alley and the internet keeps us in line and lets us know if you're a journalist, what's working, what's not working. And you realise, oh, Tweet and Goal and our boss and Hendo does really well and maybe the other stuff less so. And so I, th I think it's just more, staying in with the fans because they have such a loud voice now and you can't really be the correspondent of X club if all of the fans are tweeting every day I hate this guy he's in, he's so negative or he, you know blah 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 um, I think that's sort of what we're saying but I don't want to reopen that It's also interesting that football coverage uh, I'm talking about the Pondersy side of things now and uh, TV and radio that ahead of a blockbuster game say the Manchester Derby that someone needs to be in the Manchester City corner somebody needs to be in the Manchester yes. United corner like whatever happened to just a panel of independent observers and again this isn't I think with the GAA that that was the way and increasingly it still is the way but there's often they're striving for balance they're trying to get somebody who can take uh, kind of straddle the balance mm. whereas in, in the Premier League they really ham it up like they're going for that in a much more way where you'll see the Liverpool Man United game next week is the absolute zenith of that where it'll be proper Red Monday and uh, like really amping up both sides of the divide almost. Ronan says the bottom line is you've good journalists and crap journalists and maybe <laughs> um, define what constitutes each but either way there'll still be good sports journalists out there. When information was leaking from Manchester United you weren't happy then either. Well that was more to do with the players as opposed to the journalists. The journalists were doing great getting it. It was more that, what it said about the dressing room. Lads, why didn't you call the segment Chewing the Fat? You literally described it as that for the last two weeks as Eamon and Kildare. It did sort of, I think a slight tangent might be a probationary name. 
for the next well, no, uh, just because you're getting negative feedback now Joe you were mad about it before that I thought it was great but if the public don't like it well the public doesn't get to decide this is only a, 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 a this is only a selected it's algorithm of people who text in problem, that we're listening it? to you know what this about the silent on, majority this slot's on thin ice <laughs> <laughs> I mean this slot needs everything going for it for God's sake if it's going to survive <laughs> uh, to follow up the, my question of last week on dinner party mine would be <laughs> This is a text, uh, you know, yeah. read it out. Uh, he, sa you know, he says, excuse the recency bias of a 24-year-old. Mm -hmm. Good to have the youth listen to the show. Uh, Shane Lowry, Rachel Blackmore and Roy Keane has his or her dinner party, which is, um, yeah, I could, I'd, I'd tag along for that, I have to say. We'll get to the dinner party maybe at Sorry. the end if we've time, will we? Uh, an extension of the, what we've just been talking about. So say we're, say the problem we've just diagnosed is due to fans who are just obsessed with their own club and just want coverage of a certain kind of their own club and just want to stay in that loop forevermore and that's that's their thing they just want to read and hear and talk about Man United and that's it I was taught Dan McDonnell recently made a really interesting observation which has stuck with me he said this a couple of years ago he was saying that he reckons we broadly speaking I mean there's six seven years between uh, some of us but we are the last generation who are rounded sports fans and what he was saying was when we grew up and in my house we had two channels and maybe you'd four or five in yours but when we grew up there was no internet and there was the TV and there was a degree of well I'll watch what I'm given because the alternative is I'll have to read books or be <laughs> bored and so that means that we for from the age of about five to the age of almost 20 we ended up in June watching Wimbledon because when you turn on the BBC it was on and then in April you'd watch the Masters and the World Championships in snooker because it was on. And you'd watch GEA and rugby and football because you were starved of 24-hour sport and they were just what were on at certain times. And so we have this more rounded grasp of sports, whereas these days, if you're a Messi fan or a Conor McGregor fan or pick your poison, you just have endless content on the internet, on YouTube, and you can just deep dive and you ne it never even occurs to you you don't even know what month Wimbledon's on you don't even know the World Snooker Championships are on because you're not turned on BBC in the hope that there's something good mm. I thought it was just a fascinating point and probably like quite sad for well, I'm just I'm wondering it was just dawning me there like uh, uh, well, <laughs> if like television's coming to Ireland in the 60s really in earnest 62 yeah so like there's only probably are we kind of saying there's like two generations of that maybe? And the, and the younger ones are rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably true, but it, it's not, it's not, I don't know. I'd be only guessing. I don't know what the, what, what the feeling is now. I mean, I presume by virtue of the fact we were talking earlier about the market that by virtue of the fact these things are still on, like Wimbledon's still on, BBC and things, that there's obviously people watching. Like, is it? That's a fair point. Like, like it still obviously has some grasp but I, I, I do understand completely what you're saying about when it felt central for two weeks because it was it. Mm. Like, a, gee, God almighty, like the excitement around, when you were talking about it earlier on the news round about like 2002 World Cup particularly, it's like a month of games, constantly. Mm. Oh, it was, it was immense. It was nothing like it. Mm. But sports that aren't followed impassionately, I know you're talking about general sports fans, Joe, but like that sort of reflexive recall that people of a certain age have for sports like cricket, Formula One, that kind of thing, it, tennis obviously, snooker, in a way that the next generation, like myself included to a certain extent, don't have because... Are you, trying to, are you trying to position no, yourself as like, I'm the, saying like the, the young cool? I'm, uh, cool I'm picking, here. picking Formula One and cricket for example as uh, sports that had been terrestrial but when I was growing up were behind the sky paywall, so or increasingly behind the sky paywall, so during that that nexus point where uh, demand met with popularity where Formula One the 90s probably hit an all-time high snookers had their moment probably in the 80s and then cricket like I don't have an ashes memory in the same way a lot of people older than me do but it's cricket just never appealed to me because it was on sky and I didn't really see it so mm. um, that all sports element did dwindle as the years went by but I do think the paywall was a big part of that also mm. like it's like rugby as well like I know growing up in Sligo like there's I could be wrong. There certainly was. There's like there's one rugby club in Sligo, and I don't remember any of that. I, the, my distinct memory of I think the you have the Ireland games obviously, and then I would just the the, the Munster the Heineken Cup win when in two thousand and six, my own that was the first one, wasn't it? Six yeah. and eight, yeah. So my my memory of that is seeing the bulletin at the or the 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 slight excerpt at the top of the six o'clock news bulletin oh, or, right. or nine o'clock news, whatever it was, because we didn't have Sky, so we weren't watching it. 
And it was just like rugby had no foundation mm. whatsoever. Mm. Just uh, it, I'd say Six Nations did though. Well, it did at that time because it had this, I suppose, the slight more excitement. You'd already had the... See, six, fair enough, provincial rugby maybe not quite grabbing you, but I think like in the same way that April might have been World Snooker Championships and Augusta, I do think February and March would have been I think Ireland Six Nations games Jesus. or Five Nations games, no? Not in our house. All right, well, there's going to be the odd exception. There's going to be the odd exception, but I, I, I think Do you think it's, do you agree with Dan? Yeah, I completely agree with it. I've actually talked to Dan about it before. It's funny you say it. Uh, just go around making this Dan, point. Dan, Dan, this is one good observation. Well, I think there was it. something on when I was talking to him, and it might have been like Wimbledon, and it also might not have been, but say something akin yeah, yeah, yeah. to Wimbledon. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, this was right down tools for two weeks we're watching Wimbledon and yeah. not only watching Wimbledon but like me and my cousins and a couple of friends like honestly I would say four years in a row and that's like no joke would convince our parents to give us money to join the tennis club yeah. every June yeah. and we would a hundred, we'd swear this year <laughs> this year we'll <laughs> stick with it yeah and it's a, a week after Wimbledon, we'd never go next or near to the tennis courts again. Because why? Because we'd be down to the pitch and putt course because the, the open, open was, was on. on. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, sometimes we did stick with the pitch and putt a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, that was a great way to fill a day. Like, But, uh, you know, that was um, that was the way it was. There was a natural sporting calendar. And I don't think it, it doesn't, it absolutely didn't apply to everyone. But it, I think it applied to way more people. That yeah. was like the... the than it does now, that the sporting calendar dictated. And look, there's loads of different reasons why it's changed, but one of them is, you took the piss out of me a few weeks ago, absolutely rightly, <laughs> for saying that I listened to like an Aston Villa podcast. I actually probably listened to two, realistically, on a regular basis. Yeah. There might be three on my, that, that automatically come into my feed. You know, <laughs> between reading that, reading my correspondence, I read my correspondence. <laughs> don't automatically come in. You know, well, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't uh, listen, but I'm subscribed. <laughs> to yeah uh, but I listen to two every week I uh, have my correspondent yeah. uh, that I want to listen to you know I'll defend him to the hilt you know <laughs> if he's defending our club to you um, stick it to the mainstream media you know no but you know it's like I could literally get by with full content nearly for the week by just supporting Aston Villa I, I, if I didn't want if I didn't care about Ireland I, and, and yeah. that's that, I haven't even left football so you know like, in some ways you'd say well like that is a good thing. There's now so much more choice out there. There's Aston Villa podcast, which is the thing you really love to keep you going right the way through the week. And so on the face of it, you say, well, that's a good thing. But we are definitely losing something as well. For 100%, sure. 100 percent. We're losing that. We're losing that, I think, rounded uh, view of what sport is as well and the, the difference of it and the beauty of it as well. Like there's something like magical about it. like I remember like you know, the first day of Wimbledon, the Saturday, and you'd be just, you'd be annoyed, like, you know, you'd be, or you'd be so happy that, like, it was right around the time school ended. Well, sorry and you could watch it all more, Monday morning. I, I meant to say something to you last night. Remember you were talking about, like, watching the Williams sisters in the Wimbledon final? Yes. So again, that's back in an era, early 2000s, where we were still at just, a, you know, yeah. before the madness of the smartphone kicked off and whatever weird place we're in now, where you were just, you would still watch Wimbledon. And you mentioned that moment, and I remember that moment. So say if that moment was to happen today, I don't think in 20 years the teenagers or younger of today will remember it, because I don't think they'll be watching. Like, for instance, and we all work in the media, and now that we all have more choice, which we do, when's the last time you watched the Wimbledon ladies' final? There's another issue there, is that there's a lot more sport on TV. Of, so I would have always been more into GEA than I was into tennis. But there was perhaps one game, a Leinster hurling final on the Sunday less that might have gone against yeah. the men's. Whereas now you're going to definitely have at least two live games on the Saturday during the yeah. women's uh, final, and you're going to have two live games on the Sunday that cross over the entire men's final. So when when's the last one? I don't recall. Certainly not this year's. So the, like that's kind of interesting. Long, and and yet last ago. night you were like, man, do you remember the Williams is in the yeah, final? Yeah, I would have 100 percent watched it. Yeah. yeah. So in 20 years. Now, I always wonder as well, like, our, I don't know what kids are doing now because I'm also not a kid and I also don't have... <laughs> Ronan, you're a kid. I don't have the time to, like, I don't have the time to sit down and watch live sport from 11 o'clock in the morning until I go to bed in the evening the, yeah. the way I would have done in the past. And, look, I'm watching 
the Leinster football final, but I know Wimbledon is on, and ultimately it's a flick of a remote between the two of them, and I'm kind of watching both. Mm. You know, like I would have watched all the Nadal Federer finals. Like I was in my mid twenties then. I had plenty of time. There is, we don't have there is that, that anymore. We don't have that. Know? But I do think Dan's right that now, someone, your fifteen years ago, you could just, you just, you, you would have missed the William Sisters at Wimbledon because you were watching a game match and then you were out for a walk listening to an Aston Villa podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Isn't it to a hundred percent? Well, one thing I was, was thinking about when we we're talking about this though as well is. I remember a couple of years ago, and I try not to get involved in these things, but there was the usual Ireland had won a match, and a lot of people were trying to dismiss the fact that Ireland had won a match as a nonsense thing. And it Which sport? Rugby. Sorry, I actually, I, I, that <laughs> is a very, very important thing to specify. <laughs> Sorry, I actually thought you meant the Republic no, of people Ireland. People don't, don't tend to uh, belittle Republic of Ireland oh, no. doing things. They just tend to <laughs> think they're shite no matter what. But, uh, Look, uh, the rugby team, and there's always this culture war that comes into anything that happens with the Irish rugby team, especially if it's what rugby fans would consider high achieving. So this was going on as usual, and I was accused of being like, you know, a rugby whatever. And I was like, I'm sorry, it's like, I don't know where this thing came from, where you had to be a football guy, you had to be a GEA guy, or you had yeah. to be a rugby person. Because when I grew up, I, my dad mainly watched sport on TV yeah. and I watch sport on TV because of it so again the Five Nations was the thing that would happen at that time of year so I, I think Arthur the Five Nations is a rugby tournament <laughs> that happened before the Six Nations <laughs> but I don't know like I feel like it's become this kind of militant thing and again it's to do with Twitter let's face it like maybe most people don't experience this mm. but it feels to me like you're constantly kind of like defending your sport or arguing about one sport versus the other whereas like that never came into things our arguments about sport was are we going up to the pitch with a Gaelic football a soccer ball a rugby ball or a hurling city yeah, I know what you're saying. is rugby a bad example though because rugby seems to be the only sport that people hate and I think that's a class issue it is a class issue I think yeah maybe like, I don't nice. think anyone's like oh the hurling was crap today so what if but, Kilkenny won their 10th in a row yeah. like it like it's, it's more rugby it has also been spotlighted by social media because those uh, rivalries were to the fore through the decades as was evidenced by any autobiography from a certain era whereby they're talking about Gaelic footballers being precluded from playing soccer and vice versa so that did exist but I know from the fan point of view we're probably getting a clearer example of that now but it's interesting we were talking about the World Cup earlier and the 2002 World Cup being I remember 98 vaguely but 2002 in terms of appreciating recognising the players and being able to have a distinct appreciation of what was actually happening um, that's another age well, age drop. are you rolling I, 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 I remember <laughs> but I, you, are you old enough to work here by, to, by 2002 I knew like France should not be losing to Senegal, for example. Do you know that kind of thing? Ronan, a five year old in 2002 knew that. Well, listen, probably true. <laughs> um, but that World Cup, I remember like almost all the details. I had the DVD of the best goals and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas, and it was true of the Premier League as well, where I'd find myself the sticker albums, I'd know every single player from every single team. But that, as the years go by and you get more like multi dimensional in your interests and progress through school, obviously. Uh, you narrow that down and mix kind of sums up very well there where you strip it back to what you're particularly interested in and I think that's a fact of life probably with or without uh, the I, advent of that. Oh yeah, maybe. I miss knowing that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I really miss a, knowing who plays for... Steve like, Stone's height off by heart. Like uh, every, every team in the Premier League you'll have a good stab at that, like uh, who's there. You'll never, there's no one you'll never have heard of. For sure. I miss that. Can I yeah. say one thing that's missing as well that, that comes back to, I think, the point of amount of choice we have and the fact that you watched what was on TV because you only had a certain amount of channels. Grandstand on the BBC and Sports Stadium on, on uh, RTE. Mm. Now, this is probably for a slightly older generation. Me and Joe probably are the only ones who remember this, but you watched what you were given. Like, ultimately, I only kind of cared about the football scores. Yeah. And I was waiting for them to come in at 10 to 5, and they did final score, the same as they do now. But in the meantime, you had all day waiting for the odd latest score, and you were watching skiing and horse racing <laughs> <Yeah>. and... <laughs> Table tennis. Uh, the <laughs> whole shebang. And as it got later on, it got kind of it got even more obscure because they lost all the rights to everything. <laughs> But, you know... <laughs> Maybe that was there wasn't was AIL better. games and everything on, on Sports Stadium, and it was great. You know was what I mean? Great, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, 
it was. It was. It was generally brilliant. See, there was you probably have, too many like random like you know two two ten results from Newbury like you know. But. You of anyone I know though, I think has the most wholesome love of just sport. <laughs> Of anyone you know. Uh, of anyone I know. Whereas I think I was probably sitting through it going, well, this is a load of rubbish. Like, surely the world can do better than this. Well, you get into it. Are you telling me that you wouldn't go, ah, skiing, I'm no interested in this. And then you go, Jesus, this is... Uh, go your, your, your man, Your man is, is under in the first two splits. So he's not expected to win at all. I hope he can keep it going for the third, for the third no, split and see if he can get the gold medal. I do you think you're particularly... The meat in the Swiss Alps. Alps. No, why, why on earth would anybody listen to Aston Villa podcast? Uh... Because you support Aston Villa, I suppose. <laughs> no, it's a fair point, though. The problem is the internet, social media, the noisy minority, what happens on the internet does not always show full reflection of what the vast majority think. I wonder, is that true of rugby? Because Twitter lights up with, ugh, the Irish rugby team. Private schooled, uh, overhyped, never <laughs> criticised, etc. That is the Twitter line on rugby. I find, though, like a million people tune in to watch the Six Nations games, and generally, I think most people think... Oh, they're doing really well. They're good. Seem like decent fellas. You'd like a few less private school types in there, but uh, Jeez, on, on Twitter they feel very hated, which I, I don't think is. They, the, they they feel hated, or you feel that it feels that. Oh, it hated, feels. Yeah. It feels. Um, on Twitter, it feels like the Irish rugby team are hated. Yeah, yeah. I, but they're I a very think, soft target, though. But I don't. Do you think that's the? I don't think that's a good sample of I, of society I, at large. I, I or is it just again by virtue of the fact of what a big brand they've come in. like the fact that you can't even basically get a ticket for a Six Nations game Yeah, I think it's I think they're fine I think overall that that's not a reflector of what a reflection even of what yeah. people think no like it's they're, they're massive it's, it's, it's a massive entity like especially when you put it against what is uh, like uh, soccer in the country this Irish soccer team with all its na- natural advantages compar- in comparison yeah and the rugby team just looks like a well-oiled machine compared yeah. to it. Like it's, it's. I think they're fine. I think. I think people. I think it's just reflected in the numbers. People, as you're saying, a million people. Mm. I, if I was tuning in on the Saturday morning to watch the three New Zealand tests, that's a good barometer okay. of them. Because you know, God knows it's your first rugby match. I <laughs> like. I'm not. You know what I mean. I'm not out there. You know. I wish them the best, but yeah, not going to do anything for them. Yeah. in that regard. Yeah, the class issue though that you've mentioned before, like I think it should, like it is an issue. It is, it is, it is something that makes people feel outside of, and like they're representing Ireland, but are they representing me? I think people have that. Yeah. I, I think it's important to state that that isn't everywhere. Like, like where I grew up in, in like where I grew up in Dublin, obviously it was an issue. Where I went to my summers down in Clare, which like arguably even a far more working class area than where I was in Dublin, it. Um, not an issue at all. Right. Everybody loved rugby. Everybody right. played rugby. It was a, it was the monster thing. Very close proximity to Limerick, you know. So it isn't everywhere, but it obviously, obviously, is an issue. And we shouldn't pretend it isn't. You know yeah. that people do feel outside of it. Not to have a production meeting on air. What's our out time here? <laughs> well, uh, about, about maybe three, four more minutes. Okay. So somebody did text in the start. We're not going to get to the dinner party or the. Somebody asked about the greatest photograph in sports history. The one that jumped to my mind was Ali with the arm cock. Sunny Liston. Or was Sunny Liston. Yeah, had that yeah. in my bedroom for a long time, so maybe that's it's the most iconic, maybe. I think that is the yeah. best one. And uh, Larry Merchant is a very famous commentator. A young Larry Merchant can be seen in between two of the ropes. And like he's seen as an esteemed, venerable old man of the sport. And you used to see his little fresh face. And that's probably the moment where he thought, I'm, uh, I'm hooked on this ah, now. I never knew that. That's class. That's ah. amazing. There's a great Irish photo. I think people will, autom- I'm automatically thinking of the Sean O'Shea one from earlier this year. I think it was Info where Sean O'Shea stands to take the free and there's uh, the picture behind of the stand oh, yeah. behind him where just the, all these people are just on tender hooks waiting. Did you see Morris, Morris Brosnan Morris piece Brosnan, about it? a brilliant piece. What a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm sure everyone's seen it at this stage. He, he, he tracked down a bunch of people in the photograph looking on anxiously as Sean O'Shea's about to kick it and just got their stories. Yeah. Cool there's idea. An incredible one from a couple of years ago of, I can't believe we're talking about it, I wasn't expecting to talk about this, but there's an incredible one a couple of years ago of like a real winter's night rugby game uh, like in the RDS yeah. or somewhere like that and it's like you know steam that sort of pitch color. black and it's yeah. just the seam it's like the most perfect angle you could possibly see it's a, it's pure art you know what I mean and it's uh, again so they're just two Irish ones even off the top of my head we'll so come back to that you caught us in the hop with that although excellent uh, contributions there for something unexpected somebody was asking the Arsenal all or nothing is brilliant lads definitely the best one of the lot and somebody else was wondering are these all or nothings Premier League versions are they uh, worth the time? 
I've not watched any of them. Have you not? No. <laughs> not so, your thing. So no. <laughs> like from an Arsenal point of view, it's an interesting time for them to take on the project when you can't have said they were necessarily on an upward trajectory. I think when Spurs did it, it was a, bit, a little bit more cynical. It was tied in with their new stadium, trying to infiltrate the US market. And it was at the time they'd signed Alex Morgan and it was all sort of yeah. uh, synced up, I felt like. and trying to put a positive spin on it. I think they achieved that. That was my favourite one to date. And was it John Byrne last week that was saying about Mikel Arteta wouldn't necessarily want to be involved in this? And for a man who didn't want to be involved in it, it was like, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to see if he did want to be involved in it, because he's, he's having a whale of a time by the same. Um, he does some odd pre-match thing. I mean, we, we don't have time to talk about it. Let's talk about it next week. He really does. Like, you'd have your head in your hands. As like, the weather, it's good enough, like, I. For me, I think there's so much about it that's crap. Like, there's so much about it that's like, right, we're agreeing to do this. You can, you have editorial control, you can be in here, but make sure you thought, you know, you uh, show all the work the club is doing this way and, 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 and like interview this guy. And a lot of that's so boring. There's so many kind of like sidebars. So and all you want to do is be in the dressing room or yeah. in the canteen and listen to them all chat. Like, that's kind of all you want. But for that 10 minutes of the 50 minute show, I think it's great. But it needs, like the Spurs one I thought was way better because Mourinho's charisma just held it together and just brought it through, brought you through every episode. Mm. And you were just wondering where it was going. Whereas I think Arteta, for me, doesn't have that charisma. No, he doesn't. doesn't hold the screen in the way Mourinho yeah. did, you know. So I would still say if you're a football fan and you're in any way interested, and like I've only even watched the first episode so far, and I'm like so much more interested in Saka than I was before. And he doesn't just even really do anything. It's just that you're seeing him. Well, yeah, I was thinking, you know, you know the Beatles documentary Peter Jackson oh, put out, yeah. which is just, I think, the greatest thing I've ever seen. You've got to watch that. But I think actually... The Kanye one is pretty good as well. Oh, my God. It's so good, the Kanye one. I haven't seen the Kanye oh, one. Oh, it's so good. I'll talk about the Beatles one he, all day. He told me about it and I thought, ugh, doubt it. I'll watch it. And it knocked my socks off. Sorry, we've got to go. <laughs> uh, the Beatles documentary, what's lovely about that is it takes a while, you, you get into it and then you just eavesdrop on their conversations. As you said, Mick, I think the all or nothings just give us more of the players having very 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 mundane conversations mm. because character is, reveals itself in those moments and yeah. dynamics reveal themselves yeah. and there might be no, like Saka talk about going to Waitrose and having his mask on because it was obviously yeah. COVID and wearing a hood but being recognised and people looking for photos and he wasn't pissed off about it and he wasn't happy about it he was just a bit bamboozled by it because yeah. it was obviously after the Euros I think it needs more of that and, and less that, set piece it was fascinating yeah, yeah. It is more for football fans than Sunderland till I die or something like that. Yeah. And but I'd be interested to to see non football fans, their perception of it, does it grab you in the no, same way I'd, I'd say Formula if, One docu documentary no, does? If you're a Formula One fan watching that's a very good point. It's the most boring yeah. no, show but, you've ever seen. The no, Arsenal but I mean do you think non -ars non football fans would become Arsenal fans no. in a bit? No. No, I think it's so boring. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the Formula One thing as a story in itself and, and brings in general sports fans, I think. Yeah. Whereas yeah. The, the this is Wrexham thing that's just coming out with the Ryan Reynolds um, yeah. and Rob McElhenney, you know, element of that is going to be very interesting. Um, I think that will grab new fans. Whether Wrexham takes hold in sunny Los Angeles, I'm not sure, but yeah. you know, that's kind of more in the Sunderland till I die side of things. And apparently the episode where he gets rid of Aubameyang has just dropped. So maybe we'll touch on that next week, make a point of watching that. Uh, very fun few texts. I'll add sports stadium I'd sit through two hours of horse racing in the rain from Haydock just to hear the late Mick Dunn going through the GA highlights of the previous week it was either that or watch the Angelus in RTE2 we should on this slot in due course discuss the Angelus did you see <laughs> BBC it's on, enduring it? survival the BBC have dropped their classified read of the results do you yeah, I've seen this has become I, the cause du jour. Do you I can't believe it. I heard ah, somebody stop. say... Do you heard, actually yeah, care? It's I, one of the most soothing things nah, on radio. I heard somebody When's the say, last time you heard it? As Steve outside said, it's up there with the shipping forecast for something <laughs> I would buy just, you know, for soothing nighttime. When's sense. the last time you listened to it? I, well, I don't hold on for the Cambridge United result, Joe, but I'll... There was a great tweet problem. from somebody oh, that I saw that said, if everybody was so annoyed about this, why did it take them until Monday to notice? Yeah, I know. <laughs> as Arthur just said there, and it wasn't picked up on the mic, posers. Posers, yeah. People who aren't happy with this. Uh, for best photo, someone mentions the Maradona against Belgium made it to the World it. Cup. Yeah. The only thing, when you realise though that actually that was just a free kick that hit a wall and that's why they're all lined up against oh. Maradona. It cuts the legs from under. Yeah, so. that's, that's... Unfortunately, John and D20, when you realise... No, it's not a great their, photo. It's a great photo, but it's not their tactic. It was just the wall. Free kick rebounded, it fell to his feet. <laughs> Snap. AFC Bournemouth, nil. 
Uh, that's all. Not one of us said, by the way, Red slight tangent. Four. Not one of us said slight tangent in the entire slot. Uh, that's a slight tangent for this week. We're back again. Aston Villa nil. In the uh, Town general future seven. at some stage. When were they playing each other? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>